Hello, Lakeshore Church family. We're back again this week looking at the Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7. We're beginning today actually to go a little deeper in the, uh, this uh, passage. Matthew chapter 5, we'll be looking at the Beatitudes. But before we begin, let's just open in prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you today and I thank you for this opportunity to engage your word. We ask God that as we look into your word, that it would uh, touch our hearts, that it would move us, uh, that we'd be transformed by uh, the words that Jesus shared with his disciples and shares with us uh, by the Holy Spirit through your word. We ask today, God, that you'd be with us present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, as we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount, we really only just uh, had an introduction. The only verse that we spoke from, actually, in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount was the very last one. I think it's uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. Today we're going to begin uh, looking at the Beatitudes uh, and uh, get, a, get our heads uh, into the, that place in this uh, wonderful sermon from Jesus. Um, the sermon uh, that Jesus shared with his disciples uh, contains a focus on the lifestyle of those who would be following him. The uh, sermon has clear sections in it. Uh, if you read through it, you would know, notice the transition from one section to another. Uh, although some uh, authors nowadays will break it up in different ways, uh, it does have some distinctions. Uh, some of the uh, parts that are there are proverbial type ideas, that, like the Beatitudes themselves. Some of it is uh, um, more of a parable. Some are illustrations that Jesus shares in the context of it. And some are very direct teachings, uh, like Jesus' teaching on how to pray. Uh, and in the context of it all, some of the uh, points that are being made, some are moral points, some are spiritual disciplines that Jesus is teaching, and other parts are internal qualities that Jesus is pointing to and uh, encouraging disciples to foster in their lives. And that's really where we're coming to, to, to today as we speak about the Beatitudes. We will discover throughout the sermon that God clearly has his eyes on our hearts. If we are prone to self-condemnation or judging other people, uh, then we'll f absolutely feel the weight of Jesus' words. If we're accustomed to recognizing the kindness of God uh, and uh, see his kindness regularly in our lives and we reflect on his heart in, those con in that context, then the Sermon on the Mount will cause us to lean. Maybe at the beginning we'll be leaning away and thinking this is too much, but as we reflect and as we think about God's heart, it will actually cause us to lean into him and lean on him. Uh, the Beatitudes begin, uh, begin to pull against us in a way, but uh, in it they're asking us to lean in, to trust uh, on the Lord, to lean in and find a place of rest in the gospel. Not the, uh, not the rest of the gospel in terms of the remainder of the gospel, but the restful place that Jesus is inviting us into in the gospel. Jesus says later in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, these words, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And as we read through the Beatitudes and the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, we need to keep that verse clearly in focus in our minds and in our hearts. As we come to the Beatitudes, they start with this, this word, this word blessed. Uh, and as we contemplate it uh, right off the bat, we find it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, where it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's two fundamental ideas that are being uh, spoken of by Jesus when he speaks, speaks about people being blessed. One is the idea of favor, and the other is the idea of flourishing. Uh, 
Although blessed may not be an everyday word for people, it is quite a common one and uh, widely applied. Uh, the idea of being blessed in the context of the Sermon on the Mount needs to be understood as how a person is seen and how a person will benefit, not just how they are seen, but also how they will benefit uh, as a result of how God sees them. So this idea of favor comes out from that word blessed. The idea of being in a position of favor is something that most people really relish. They want to find favor. We want to have favor uh, at our, in our jobs, or maybe we want to have favor in school, uh, or perhaps it's a favor that we want to find in a family context, like favor with our spouse. Uh, regardless of what it is, uh, some people automatically have an advantage when it comes to worldly favor. Uh, people who have wealth have a, a kind of favor that uh, is afforded them uh, by notoriety. Uh, people who are popular also have an automatic kind of favor that comes their way. But when we're thinking of favor in the context of the Beatitudes, it's not something unattainable. Uh, that Beatitude we already spoke of, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It would be ridiculous for us to say, blessed are the poor, for theirs are the yachts of the seas. Or, blessed are the poor, for, they'll have the, for they have great mansions. It's just not the way it works. But when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and bringing this idea of blessing and favor uh, uh, forth as an idea, he's talking to people about something that any person can actually enter into. It's a type of uh, status and setting within our hearts as we engage people around us and as we engage the Lord, that each person can choose. This one that we're looking at already, blessed are the poor in, the poor in spirit. This is an attitude that we have before the Lord uh, as we reflect on ourselves in our own lives. Uh, the list of qualities found in the Beatitudes are things that persons can't, people can't be eliminated from. Uh, everybody can enter into them. The structure of the Beatitudes is are eight, in eight key phrases, each of two parts. The first is the pronouncement of blessing, like blessed are the poor in spirit. The second part is explaining an element of their blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the type of person, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the element of blessing in their lives. Being poor in spirit is having a level of humi humility regarding our state. It's a, a humility that uh, we recognize and an awareness that we have that uh, without the Lord we have nothing. Uh, we are not uh, independently valuable, but rather our incredible value comes from Jesus and how he attributes value to us. Think of it this way. If I have a $5 bill and I have a $100 bill, which one is more valuable? Well, of course, we think the $100 bill is more valuable. But if we really think about it, each of them has the same amount of paper. Each of them probably has the same expense with regards to how much ink is in it. What makes a $100 bill more valuable is that we attribute value to that $100 bill. If tomorrow the government were to, uh, or if overnight the government were to say, all currency is now worth nothing. When we wake up in the morning, if we wake up with a $100 bill in our pocket it will, and a $5 bill in our pocket, both will have the exact same value. Really? Nothing. In fact, we'd probably consider a sticky note at that point more valuable because we could use it for something. The idea of flourishing is also in that idea of being blessed. The idea... Uh, held within uh, of flourishing is both now and yet to be. They flourish now and yet will flourish in the future. Some have translated the, the scriptures uh, instead of being blessed as being happy, I said. Happiness is obviously a current status. The thing is, as we move through the Beatitudes, we'll see that each of them have a complementing benefit. We have already discussed that, but let's 
Just consider a couple. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In each of these, there's the state of their heart, the status that they hold with regards to uh, people around them and the way they position themselves before the Lord, but then how God sees them and the favor and the blessing that comes towards them in the context of it. As we continue to contemplate the Beatitudes, there's also this other element I want to point out th today. It's this point that uh, of the eight key Beatitudes that exist, uh, the first one and the eighth one each start with that complementary benefit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's really as though Jesus, as he was pre preaching, had book, uh, put play, bookmarks or bookends on each of these thoughts. And uh, the point that Jesus is making is that this is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Everything that's held within these is really speaking about the kingdom of heaven. So it starts with, blessed are the poor in spirit. It ends with, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When scripture speaks of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, it's speaking of something that has an already but not yet element that we need to keep in mind. The idea of already but not yet speaks of the fact that for the followers of Jesus, the kingdom is not something that shall one day, uh, the, for, for followers of Jesus, the kingdom is not only something that will shall one day be fully realized, but has an already has already become, in reality, uh, in our lives a deposit. Listen to the words from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter seventeen, verses twenty and twenty one. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, Jesus. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Uh, some translations actually say, for the kingdom of God is in your heart. It's also interesting that the verb tense of the words here for, the, uh, for declaring the kingdom of God is, or the kingdom of heaven is theirs, is actually in the present tense. Jesus, uh, when he was saying these things, wanted it to be clear that the kingdom of God is a reality that exists inside of us already. It's not just something to be longing for. Although I, I really believe the disciples and those listening on, probably when they heard Jesus speaking of the kingdom of heaven in a present tense, expected that any moment that Jesus would be uh, declaring his right to rule in the nation of Israel and uh, would be, uh, you know, taking his throne. There was this anticipation in the disciples, even after Jesus ascended into heaven, that in any moment Jesus would have uh, his rule. There's this internal sense of the kingdom of God, but there's also that external expectation of when Jesus will return and uh, establish his kingdom forever. As mentioned uh, uh, in the book of Romans, Jesus, uh, Paul writing says in Romans 14, verse 17 and 18, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. If a kingdom has riches, power and resources, but is lacking in righteousness, peace and joy, then who wants that kingdom? We have kingdoms in the world where they do have resource, rich in power and authority. Uh, and uh, many of those countries uh, would be horrible to live in because of the unrighteousness that exists there. God's kingdom is more than a flag. It's more than a name. It's more than a constitution or a charter of rights and freedoms. 
It moves beyond the material elements of paper and bricks, wealth and concepts. As we'll see over the course of the coming weeks, the kingdom of heaven is a matter of the heart. Jeremiah, prophesying of the coming kingdom covenant, said, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. As we come to the Beatitudes in the coming weeks, we're looking at a type of proverbial comment on what the followers of Jesus should look like and what will, and what will be the outcome of their modeling of the life of Christ. The kingdom of heaven understood in the context of the greater message through the Lord's Prayer is this, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The context is also the understood and expected king, kingdom age. It was broadly anticipated that the Messiah was coming in the days that Jesus uh, arrived on the earth. And today we still have that anticipation of Jesus coming, but we also have that uh, solid establishment of his kingdom in our hearts because he's brought peace and joy to us through his salvation. So that's our message for this morning. Uh, next week or in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking more in depth at the Beatitudes one by one. But I want to leave you with this. When you read the Beatitudes over the next couple of weeks, and I encourage you to do that, think about how each one of them is a challenge to us. They're not easy things. These are not things that uh, come naturally or easy to us. But the Lord is inviting us into them. And there is certainly blessing as we uh, trust in the Lord and as we take on these attitudes. Let's uh, contemplate not just the blessing, but the blessing that we can be uh, to those around us and to the Lord himself as he sees the kingdom flourishing in our hearts and uh, flourishing from our hearts as we care for those around us. Let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. And as we contemplate the challenge of, uh, of the Beatitudes uh, in the coming weeks, God, we ask that you would help us. Lord, even as I've mentioned, uh, they seem hard, not simple. And uh, it might be easy for us to, uh, to lean away from them instead of into them. But God, help us to do neither. Help us to lean on you so that these things would be a natural part or a supernatural part, actually, of our lives because of you. Because, really, God, these aren't things that are easy, and we need your help. So help us to be like your son Jesus, we ask. And we ask it in his name. Amen.